Good morning, women of light and anyone else is watching on any other channel that we have. You may be watching on YouTube or you may be watching on my business page, um, uh, Elizabeth Eleanor, the Spiritual Warrior. Today, is, so it's Wednesday Wisdom, we're in the middle of the week, which is unusual for me, um, like it feels like this week has gone really fast I um I was not well last week so I had to cancel everything and it just feels like everything's flying (laughs) this week it's amazing uh but we have the beautiful Sandra uh Gui have I said that properly excellent uh and and um this is a little bit of a different um interview because we're talking about um, Japan and Japanese sake, which is really uh, going to be a beautiful topic. My kids absolutely love uh, Japan. They haven't been. I The very first place I ever went to, um, the first time I went overseas was um, Japan, actually. I, I stayed there just overnight uh, on my way to Germany. And um, <clears throat> it was really... Um, special for me because I'd never been overseas before I was in my 20s and um and I worked out how to get from my hotel early in the morning uh onto a bus and um through the um streets of Japan in you know a little um village and got myself to a temple and was able to you know sit and meditate at this temple and uh, it was an amazing experience because I meditated in this temple and next thing I hear, hear this huge gong go and I opened my eyes and the whole temple's full and I didn't even realise anyone had, had come in and they were just about to have a ceremony and they had a fire in there and they had priests in white clothes and it was so special for me. So, um, yeah, so I have fond memories. And my kids, if, if um, when my kids move, they, uh, the first thing they do is they look for somewhere that they can get um, chicken katsu curry. <laughs> oh. so, so tell us a little bit about yourself, well, Sandra. Well, first, first of all, um, Elizabeth, you know, you just described Japan perfectly, you know, um, the way you were explaining about, you know, um, going to a temple because Japan has a lot of temples. So the fact that you found one, um, even though in your short stay is um, you've really experienced that glimpse of what Japan, you know, really offers. So the gong, you know, because in Japan, there's a lot of, you know, um, temples where people go worshipping and pray to a lot of shrines. So shrines is really big in Japan and every prefecture will have a shrine. So um where if you see a shrine, you know, you just can't help yourself. Even not being being non-Japanese, you will go to the shrine and actually, you know, want to do um, that that's that healing, that spiritual, because that's what you were all about as well. That's what you and the incense and yes. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, burning an incense is a very calming, you know, Zen moment. Um, even I'm not in a temple, I'll do it at home because I want my whole, you know, like sort of like house, my environment, like because I'm also, um, you know, Chinese as well. So we're a bit feng shui as well. So bringing that chi as well as balance and energy around you to surround you just to give you some peace, you know, with yourself. So that's all about, um, pretty much, you know, Japan just can do that in just a simple moment like that. So thank you, um, Elizabeth, for sharing that um, beautiful trip about Japan, even though a short trip, but that's really what Japan really offers as one piece of the tradition, customs and cultural experiences. But about myself, so who am I? Uh, my name is Sandra Gui. Uh, I'm a mother of two teenagers. Um, I run my own business, which is a quarter eye psychic education, but I also help run my um, parents' business, which is the biggest, you know, the biggest retail, um, Japanese uh, retailer in Perth. So um, about myself and how I became a psychic educator, well, um, go back into my childhood. So I was brought up in, um, you know, Asian family business. So I literally, you know, watched my parents' work life as I grew up. So what they did, what they do. So it was really endorsed to me as a child. Um, I was known by customers as the baby in the counter. 
So I literally grew in the counter and all my you know, <laughs> those customers who are aunties and uncles to us, they say, oh, your, your daughter was in front of the counter, behind the counter. Oh, that's, is that her now when they saw me grow up? I, and my parents say, yeah, that's the baby in the counter. So <laughs> my family business, you know, needs to be the biggest retailer in Perth WA as Asian food groceries as well. So throughout my youth and my uni time, I was like running the shop uh, for good on 10 years. Wow. We had two branches. So I was maintaining the mother branch, but I needed a challenge. So I wanted to see, you know, what I could do with the sister branch. And the sister branch was struggling. And the difference was the compared to the mother branch, that was the only branch that had, you know, the liquor license to sell alcohol. So the demographics were different to the mother branch and the area, um, you know, and walk-in traffic was a different area to the mother branch. We had to deal with the fact, you know, that nobody came into the area and continuously, like a regular basis. And we had to, you know, survive, you know, without that, how do we make the sales? So although we had the biggest supply of, you know, groceries at that time, because there was no like walk-in traffic, the groceries never moved. So for good on like two months since I stationed myself in the sister branch, I was thinking, what could I do to make it better? But the thing is, no matter what I did, how beautiful I made my products, how beautiful I made the shelves, how clean the shop was, the, I couldn't control the fact that nobody was coming in. So through boredom, <laughs> trying to figure out and being lost as well, I started to look around my, the shop, the sister branch, and find out what could strike interest to, you know, the market in the area. Then it dawned to me that I had like these big Japanese you know, sake bottles, just to show you how big. Yeah, so big, big like Wow, so massive. That is massive, Way right? bigger than a wine bottle. Yes, they are. So that drawed my attention. I was saying, well, I have all these big, you know, Japanese bottles in the shop. But the thing is, like, um, nobody knows about it and nobody knows about this product. So a few things went through my mind, right? So I was thinking about my father. Uh, who was ambitious and loved what he'd do. And he worked hard for his family to provide for us. And I have to thank him personally because he provided me the legacy to grow and nurture um, to something great, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And, and to, like, um, to run a business is a big thing and to have it in your family, um, you know, like I, my mum also ran her own business. So it sort of yes. becomes part of your blood, doesn't it? You know, you, you yes. actually get to learn how to grow and experience as you go along. Yeah, exactly that. And, um, you know, um, I, I will mention, you know, I was quite stubborn when I was young and being, you know, still young and youthful, you don't want to be stuck in a family business. But as you get older and mature, you, you tend to look back and see what your parents do. So that's the maturity level. Absolutely. So I was thinking that day, that day, <laughs> um, you know, do I let my dad's legacy die or do I let it live? So I chose to let it live. So that day was the biggest challenge I faced in my entire life. So I was taking on the world of Japanese sake and cultivating to the, a very young market, so the local market, with this niche product. Because back in the day, um, nobody knew or understood or wanted to understand what, you know, Japanese sake represented. So to support my new challenge, I wanted to become knowledgeable. So I was able to provide the best experience to my customers who wanted to purchase and wanted to understand about Japanese sake. But the problem of during that time, there was no sake education. Um, there was no source of valuable information and no sense of, you know, mentorship or, you know, advice within my industry to answer my questions for my customers. So I had to learn the basics I needed to know about Japanese sake by myself for a good whole month and ask my Japanese friends to translate the Japanese sake bottles, information, to see what that meant. Then I could actually, you know, um, comprehend that as well as translate that to my customers who are not Japanese people. They were the local, you know, Australians. Mm -hmm. so from, from there, I started to do tasting in the shop. And I started to sell, you know, Japanese sake with confidence of what I knew about Japanese sake. So I started to get more ambitious. I, I just wanted to reach more people because in the shop is very small. The reach is very small. So 
because I was ambitious like my father in the blood, I wanted to, you know, reach out to more people to the real market who I haven't yet, you know, touched their hearts or captured or even showed them that this world exists. So I opened up my new business adventure while doing, you know, quarter eye psych education. And I started to do, you know, collaboration psyche events with other businesses to get my voice out uh, as quickly as I can. Um, then suddenly I get hit with COVID epidemic. So, yeah. <laughs> Yep, I've, I've been hit again. So, um, so what, what it did actually, you know, um, forced me to improvise what else I could do and really push me to think, of, you know, what else you can offer. So I branched further and I went through, uh, went to the, um, you know, the idea of online psyche tasting experience, Zoom life experience, you know, virtual experience. And mostly people who tend to take this experience with me are from interstate. So you're your states so even though I can't see them in person but online there's a lot of opportunity yeah absolutely and so can you tell us a little bit about like how is his sake made like yeah. it's it's different it's not from what uh from grapes is it like wine is no it is made out of rice so I'm just going to show you a prop which I share with my students so that's rice, okay? Yeah, so yeah. This is, uh, you know, rice that they're specifically, either are made specifically for Japanese sake, but also you could also use, you know, normal rice that they grow from Japan. So the main feature, the main ingredient is rice, but it accommodates everything about Japan. It's not just rice. It needs, you know, water to brew. It needs, you know, um, the cultivation of that rice coming from who has grew that rice. It needs the technique of, you know, the maker, which we call this, uh, for most people, uh, non-Japanese people say sake maker, um, to actually control how the brew is happening. And it needs yeast to actually change the element of starch, which rice has, to convert that into sugar, and then allow the yeast to have food to convert that into alcohol. So yeah, it's, so it's still a fermentation process, isn't it? Yes. Well, you seem to know this word. Yes, it's fermentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I uh, make kombucha at home. So, ah, um, it's yeah. It's very popular kombucha. And everybody is saying, oh, I'm, I can make kombucha whenever I talk to them about the sake production. Now I'm saying, ah, then you know what fermentation is. So Yeah, that's, that's right. What it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so you run online courses obviously, like, do you do, like, um, education courses? Yes. So, um, you know, two years down, the, um, from two years ago, I was approached by a, you know, Sake Sommelier Association um, Academy to become an educator. So I represent, you know, Australia to actually teach people how to become Sake professionals. So I offer, you know, certification, but I also offer online Sake tasting experience. So my interstate customers who um, have been taking, you know, my experience uh, through a um, platform called Class Bento have been loving my experience and they are no professional. They are no, you know, expert in sake. It's just normal people like yourself, you know, want to be curious about what Japan offers and they love Japanese food. So they go to the restaurant and they order see a sake list and they don't know what to do. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. Makes sense. So, they come to this online experience and normally during the COVID time it's been very, very popular because you get to do a tasting experience with a coach as well as enjoy it in the comfort of your own home. So we go through a... So, so how do you do that? You, you send them samples of the yes. sake? Oh, wow. So I call, it's called my sake journey box. So, and it's like a tasting at home kit. So I send that uh, to, they pay through the platform. I send them the kit. I send them a booklet um, to go through the guide and they do the um, experience with me online and I guide them through. So my way of guiding is what I do with my workshops and masterclass in person here in Perth as well. Um, and what I do, I open up the floor to their own, you know, experience. I love to see how my customer you know, opens up an experience from them within themselves and actually, you know, share what they can. I don't 
you know, I tell you what to say. I don't tell you what to experience. You experience that already. But I make you know, understand how Japan, you know, connects with that and what you're experiencing. How beautiful is, you know, the rice brew magic. So a lot of my, um, you know, class bento participants have, you know, just came from, you know, beginners level. And it was a safe opportunity for them to actually ask, you know, all these, you know, dying curious questions, you know, and I told them whatever the question is, it doesn't matter how stupid you may think it is, just ask me because I had a lot of stupid questions when I wanted to know. And I was thinking, should I ask if I had to ask them because I needed to know. Yeah, that's right. If you don't ask, you don't, you don't get to, yeah. So my participants, I tell them, if there's no questions, I've done my job, but I, please ask me a question, you know, and it always came to the same, you know, problems. Um, they can't, they want to choose a sake in a Japanese restaurant and they want to know how to, you know, pair or what drink will be good with that food and see that joy because they want that Japan experience. But mm, what mm. we find is because of there is a lack of, you know, sake education in Japanese restaurants that customers are not getting, um, getting that experience. So I've got and this do you job. Find, yeah. and, and do you find also um, that because there's the lack of the education, that Japanese restaurants may even limit um, the, the type of sake that they actually um, have to offer? Because, you know, I suppose I'm, I'm just assuming that there's, like just like with with a red wine or a white wine, there's so many different variations. Um, that this there's the same. Is that the same with sake? So here's what I normally see in Japanese restaurants because of <clears> the <throat> lack of sake education. Um, most common one you see the wine list overtake the sake list yeah. in a Japanese restaurant. Only reason is because it's easy to accommodate to wine for foreigners rather than sake because the staff do not know how to promote the sake list to a foreigner and they prefer to make sure that they have sales so it's easier to you know soothe them with wine that they know right yeah so foreigner comes into a japanese restaurant they don't know how to choose a sake but they need to drink they will always be in that comfortable mindset rather than uh, interesting or adventurous mindset because they just want to probably only enjoy the food fat nobody offers the sake experience to them but if there's a choice that they have to have a drink because you have to have drink or alcohol with food in a restaurant there's always a wine list and that wine list is first and then mm -hmm. the sake list is invisible and when people yeah. start to question the sake list they don't know how to choose so the first thing you want to do is ask the waiter um i saw a sake list here right but which one should we choose and if you do get a response, they normally would choose you the most expensive sake with no understanding of making the customer understand why is it so expensive. And then they get pulled off from, you know, trying the sake. They maybe try it once and they say it was good, but they will never try it again because there was no experience. Yeah. And so why would it be the most expensive? Um, because the thing about the truth about, you know, restaurant um, pricing and compared to retail pricing, it is double or triple the retail price because they have to pay by, you know, serving, whereas we pay by the bottle, right? Yeah. And if the, um, you know, restaurants, you know, pay by the bottle, you're going to think of it's tr triple, you know, double times the retail from a bottle. You have to think. Um, you know, um, the restaurants cannot be the same as retail, else we have too much controversies. Yeah, but but why would be like um, what would make one sake more expensive than the other? Like, is it the flavor? Is it the way it's fermented? How would it? Yep. So okay, now you got to understand we are in Australia, right? So the, there's two two angles of why you think of going with the pricing. Um, is the cost price from the supplier is um, high. But if you're talking about how do they rate, now there's a ambiguity because it all depends on how the supplier gets, you know, the sake. You buy shipments, it's normally, and you buy bulk, it's going to be cheaper, right? But in a world or in a market where, you know, sake or, you know, a beverage is still very new, 
we're scared to make that bigger purchase. So we will order maybe a one carton or a very small quantity, right? So mm. the price or the value will be higher than that. Okay. So in terms of, you know, um, understanding that price of, you know, quality and sake really is much more accurate in probably Japan than compared to Australia, because we have to pay things like shipment fee called freight. And, you know, wine sale tax is, you know, government loves to tax us on and GST. So yeah. before we even get to the cost, I've already got charged, you know, an arm and a leg already. So the rest yeah. of my body is yet to be cut off, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, but as consumers and, you know, people buying, you know, the, um, the produce and, you know, the product, they don't put that into consideration before they judge on the price. So what we get, like even in the shop, you know, restaurants, they'll complain, but they can't complain too much because they know it's restaurant. But when you get to the retail, they even complain even more. How, why is it so expensive? They want to purchase a bottle of sake and take it home, but they complain it's too expensive. You got to understand, I keep on saying to my customers, not to be rude, but I'm telling you a fact, it's an imported product. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not an Australian breed product, okay? It's like a, another drink um, that everybody's raving about um, that is actually not been brewed in Japan, but it's actually brewed in Australia. And they are comparing the, the quality over the price. So the thing is, people are paying premium for quality because it's coming from, you know, overseas, a different country. But mm. if you're paying premium price when it's brewed here, nobody's going to buy it. There's yeah. a difference. People will and, question that and- here. And is it um, the length of the, you know, the, the amount of time that it takes to brew it to, that would make it more expensive or is it the ingredients that go with it or? Yes. So the second one, um, brewing yeah. time is pretty much the same for most breweries. It, it doesn't matter. They will have to brew in winter time and it has to be brewed that time. But it is what you said, the ingredients. Now, in, if we can't even go back to Japan, You know, growing rice and a very, you know, special rice is hard work. And you have to um, grow the rice that is like, you know, a field, a yield, right? Mm -hmm. You're not growing a small area. You're growing a whole, you know, yield. And the water water that's needed for um, rice caddies is is unbelievable because it's, you know, has to be flooded, right? Um, Yes. Oh, no. Uh, rice paddies, they are already like in the environment and vegetation of, you know, able to um, be grown in the right, you know, environment. So it's not about flood, floodness um, because else all the rice, you know, paddies will be, you know, um, cannot grow because you need enough water, um, me, uh, what is it, water level to yeah. grow, grow the right. You can't go over because else it will just flood. Flood will kill the rice paddies as mm. well, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So the water is actually coming from a different source, like, you know, water force, um, fresh spring water, even, you know, groundwater or wells, you know. And some breweries um, have to actually, you know, climb, uh, take a truck and go to where the water source is, which is like maybe two hours away or three hours away from the brewery. And, there was one brewery that actually had to climb a mountain to the water source with a truck and fill that up with water and then take it to the brewery. So it's actually either transportation or if the brewery is lucky, they're right next to the water source where they can Yeah, access. right. So yeah. it is nothing to do with the water from the rice paddy. Rice paddy, um, you know, cultivation is one part. Um, water source is another part. Um, yeast is another um, element which they bu- get from the actual Japanese association, you know, um, brewery. And also there's another element which actually allows this process to happen, which has to be made in the brewery. And this is called koji. And that's rice and, um, you know, propagated um, with, you know, rice mold or like um, fungus to convert the rice starch into enzymes to then be able to be, you know, converted into sugar ready for the yeast to eat as to convert the alcohol. Because the fact is rice is no, um, nothing to convert to alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you understand fermentation, it needs sugar when you add yeast, like wine is the same, beer is the same. They need a sugar element to convert that into alcohol um, else you don't have alcohol. You just have, you know, a rice starchy brew. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You need something that's going to like feed the the culture. Yeah. Yeah. And so, do they flavor sake? So here's the beautiful thing about sake. Um, I love, you know, sharing the magic about sake because especially with, you know, customers who's never tried sake before, they always ask me, what's that fruit in that sake? And that that is telling them, so did you put any fruits in there? You know, you can smell, you know, either, you know, banana or pineapple or apple or strawberry, lychee, um, aniseed, um, you know, coffee and caramel, salt caramel, soy sauce, you know, it, the list goes on. There's a lot of different you know aromatics you can experience with different sakes that people have been telling me you know and the aromatics are always different with people but we don't put anything inside it all comes from oh. the yeast that driven through the fermentation and the purpose of you know the technique and craftsmanship of the you know sake maker to make that happen to give you those fruity elements now they have a, a expectation of what fruity elements you will experience but what i found was not everybody's going to get those fruity aromatics exactly but maybe you'll get maybe one or two so the idea about sake is not to, um, you know, to tell you what you should expect, but what can you um, experience yourself. And that's what um, I find that the modern world of, you know, Japanese sake um, has allowed consumers to feel because it's much more fun and exciting that way. Because being a, you know, a sake student myself, when I, um, my lecturer was telling me, you know, you can smell this, um, you know, vanilla, pineapple, banana, cheesecake or whatever sort of thing. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I can't smell a goddamn thing, you know? And what I find that was happening to my consumers, what what it was happening to my customers, my businessmen. And I didn't want to feel like I needed to tell them aroma because it will brainwash you thinking that you have to find that aroma. And yeah. you may, may not remember anything, but someone just told you a, a a you know a aromatic note you think yeah you just agree yeah you know I said no that shouldn't be like that so I don't tell my consumers or my participants or my students to tell me what uh, t to say a note and then find it I said tell me what you find tell me what you experience because it's much more fun and that's their journey and I believe a lot of yeah you know, that's right yeah, a lot of consumers prefer their own journey rather than a journey that was made for them or told for them, if that makes sense. And that's what, you know. Kind yeah, of absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And so how do people get in contact with you and to have that experience of, yeah. Um, so I, um, you know, <coughs> offer, you know, the tasting experience through the Class Bento website because I've been supporting this company and they've been supporting me for the online experience for, um, you know, Class Bento. So I can definitely share it, you know, in the um, New Zealand, but it's actually Class Bento. If you look it up online, you can find and look for, you know, sake tasting at home and you can see the reviews or what people say and, you know, book in a session with me. So I have, you know, regular sessions. So um, you will get the kit. You need at least two weeks, at least because of COVID travel and all that and packages and all that to mm -hmm. actually send me, send you the kit, which you pay for. And then, you know, you hop on a Zoom call on your day and I will always update, you know, my participants, you know, making sure they have everything, what they need to prepare and, you know, be ready for the experience. So I make it so it's like, you know, friendly and easy going. It's not like something that you feel like you have to be rushed. You feel like you feel it's too complicated, you know, that sort of thing. And it's a bit of fun, yes, sort of like a wine tasting at home sort yes. of thing. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you know that when Zoom came out because of COVID, there was a major, you know, trend happening where everybody was drinking online? Yeah. And I saw that and I, and I bounced on it. I was like, I want to do sake tasting online. So yeah. I, I offered, I, um, you know, uh, connected with Japan and I got my sake breweries to connect with me and we do a Zoom, you know, show to talk about their brewery because that time Japan was struggling. So I wanted to support my brewery in a small way if I can to share, you know, what is the beautiful world about Japanese sake and allow, you know, my participants to support this brewery, even though they were virtually in Japan. And what I found was we were connecting everywhere. We we're connecting Italy. We we're connecting, you know, France. We we're connecting in UK. 
and also um, United States. And I'm thinking, I'm in Australia. How did I connect there? You know, but the virtual world is, is you know, full of opportunity. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I um, I actually went on to, um, you know, the Airbnb site. Yep. Um, when, um, when COVID was happening, I don't know how it, how I thought to do it actually, but I went on to the Airbnb site and they went from um, just selling, uh, you know, um, opportunities for accommodation to yeah. experiences. So you can go onto the Airbnb site and um, learn how to make a tiramisu from, from an Italian chef or yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like there's all these opportunities. So I don't know if you're on the Airbnb side, but that's another platform for you to. Yeah, um, I, I they, I'm definitely, sh- um, that's a great share because it's kind of like for Australia, we're doing the class bento. That's what they were offering. Um, the class bento website was really, you know, bridging in that gap during the, you know, COVID time. And mm. they um, called me up as they saw me as, you know, a interest for their you know corporate client um clients on that on that web web website and um i say yeah why not you know i don't know what i'm going to offer uh what people would think about me but you know this is another way just to bridge in you know where i can land my you know seed in different platforms and yeah it really rose you know the last two years since that and um it started slow but because nobody knows me now I've got to say you can't expect someone to know you if you they don't know you so yeah, it that's... takes time to yeah. get your voice out so something like you know doing something with you and I hopefully more people will know me now you know yeah but yeah that's, that's right that's how how it is so I've never you know judged the fact that what was the reality what was the fact and I keep on saying to myself you know I can't you know condemn the world or the people uh if I don't if I'm not getting any response because how do I know if they knew me they don't just like here in Perth was small I tell you I still haven't targeted all of Perth I'm going to target a very small area and not everybody knows me in Perth so I'm still you know soldering Floating along yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> you know? and but that's 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 reality that is why we do something like this do live shows you know do interviews social media instagram reels yeah i've done it quite a bit so um just to get your face and voice out there and um, yeah yeah and so um when we finish if you can just jump in and, and put your website in um I know that um, like it's, it sounds like fun, you know. So it's something to do at home. Um, I'm gonna, I'll tell my um, son. My daughter doesn't drink alcohol at all. So, um, but I'll tell my son because him and all of his friends would um, really enjoy the experience. A lot of so. people have, you know, connected with Japanese sake to connect to Japan. That's another, you know, experience. So you get two or even three type of different experience than one. It's not just, you know. People may think it's just uh, it's just drinking. It's not. It's a culture. Um, yes. Actually, yeah. showing you a drink culture, but we're not focusing on drinking. We're focusing on experience and culture and understanding and embracing a different country. So that's what Japanese, you know, sake experience is all about. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, um, looking forward to having you know, if you can just put the link in the bottom. Um, and so lovely to chat with you, Sandra. Oh, it's been lovely. Thank you so much, um, Elizabeth. Really appreciate this opportunity you've given me today. Yeah, yeah. And um, love to hear what your experience is. If you're watching, um, just throw in the comments if you've ever been to Japan or you're interested in finding out more. Um, and we will um, see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.